All right, so good morning and welcome to Falling Walls Lab Brisbane here at UQ, um, hosted in proud partnership with Study Queensland and Trade Investment Queensland. My name is Caroline Stott. I'm the Associate Director for Research Partnerships here at UQ, and it's my pleasure today to take you through the program and the event. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, do an acknowledgement to country and take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of UQ, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Now, a little bit about the program for today. We have quite a lot jammed into the next two hours. So the way it's going to start, we'll have a number of introductory addresses from um, some guest speakers. We will then have our eight pitches, the presenters here sitting in the, in the front two rows, and best of luck to you all today. Thank you so much for entering the competition and being here with us. We can't wait to hear uh, what you're uh, going to put forward. Once we hear from all of these presenters, um, the jury will have an opportunity to deliberate, think about um, the challenge, the solution and the impact that's been presented. They'll take a moment um, to go outside and, and meet for about 20 minutes. In the meantime, we will do a, a hosted Q&A with the presenters. Um, and then once the jury have reached a decision on the three finalists, they'll come back in, we'll award the presentations and there'll be uh, some light refreshments and networking afterwards. So that should hopefully take us through to about 12 noon with that additional hour for networking. So we'll do our best to stay on track. As for housekeeping matters, if there is an emergency, please follow staff and use the signed exits. So probably best to follow Tamara in the blue because I will not know where to go. <laughs> but mainly out this front door and then the signed um, evacuation uh, exits by all the stairways. The bathrooms are also out the door um, through to the main foyer and then down to the right. And if you do have mobile phones or other devices, please switch them to silent because we don't want to interrupt the presenters when they've only got three minutes to convey their messages. Now, Falling Walls Brisbane, um, as I mentioned, is in partnership with Study Queensland, and we wish to acknowledge and thank Study Queensland for their invaluable continued support and contribution to fostering the Australia-Germany Research Network. Um, we wish to also acknowledge and thank our supporting and network partners, and there are a few of these, so I'm just going to, uh, to read them out here. The, the Falling Walls Foundation uh, in Berlin, the Embassy of the Federal Pu Republic of Germany, the German Consulate in Brisbane, the Academy, the Australian Academy of Science, Google and UQ. And I'd also like to thank our guests from the Office of the Chief Scientist, QUT, and the University of Southern Queensland. Now, Falling Walls, as that video has just showed you, um, is a fantastic initiative. It was established in Berlin, Germany, and designed to act as a global hub to progress impact oriented ideas and discoveries and then to make these accessible to society and really break down those walls. In 1989, the Berlin Wall was torn down and Falling Walls embodies the spirit of this time and the events that took place. And really it's around turning these ideas into action for a more open, peaceful and sustainable world. So Falling Walls brings together students and early career professionals from across the globe to present their visions to how to make the world a better place for all. Now, there are thousands of ideas put forward and you're just going to hear a small selection today, but approximately 70 parallel competitions are held across the globe. This culminates in the finale, which takes place in Berlin, where up to 100 finalists pitch to an audience of decision makers, you know, hundreds of people, I think up to a thousand um, at the last conference in Berlin, and they pitch their ideas to industry, government, other representatives in the room who have the opportunity to actually help move those ideas into reality. Now, the first step today is this event in Brisbane. We will be selecting three finalists today, um, as well as a People's Choice Award. And the three finalists, the next step on their journey is travelling to Canberra to present at the National Conference um, in September, and that will be hosted with the Australian Academy of Science. 11 national finalists 
will be um, at that event and the judging panel in Canberra will then select three finalists who will then travel to Berlin and compete at the event in November. And it, it's very fitting with the timing, um, November travelling to Berlin and competing on the anniversary of the fall of the wall. Now, shortly, um, we're very pleased that we can um, be here today and hear from the national winner for last year, um, Dr. Clara Jang from UQ. But first, I'd like to introduce Professor Aidan Byrne, the Provost of the University of Queensland, to provide a welcome address. Thank you, Aidan. Thank you, Carolyn. And good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here to our campus this morning. Um, I too would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands in which we meet, pay my respects to our elders past and present as we walk together on the path to reconciliation. A welcome to our other special guest, Lauren Stevenson. Nice to have you here from the Office of the Queensland Chief Scientist. Uh, special thank you too uh, to Serena Hoban from Study Queensland. Delighted to have you here. Uh, Michael, always a pleasure uh, to have Michael here as the Honorary Consul from the Federal Republic of Germany and a professor at QUT and uh, Julia Carter, Head of Science and Innovation at the Embassy. Delighted to have you come back here onto our campus again. Really pleased to have people from other institutions in Queensland. It's a, an occasion where we can partner uh, with universities across uh, our state, uh, interact together. And events like these are are actually about interaction. Uh, this metaphor, falling walls, I have to say is a particularly personal one for me. Uh, I spent two years in Germany in 87 and 88, and uh, then came back here in 89 and saw the wall come down. And then in going back to Germany, as I have been seeing the transformation that happened as a consequence of that, the consequence of opening borders, sharing ideas, and the way indeed that the, the German people and countries united together as a model for us all. And I, as I say, it's a deeply, deeply personal metaphor. Um, events like this too are, are very important as well. Um, we've got three minutes on the clock here. I'm always very impressed at occasions like this where we force people to pitch their ideas in such a short time, period of time, how impressive they are at capturing difficult concepts in a short time. But deeply impressed too at the range of ideas that get shared and connected across boundaries. And again, that is the deep metaphor of, of falling walls, I think. Um, the alum here have also gone on to achieve significant global impact in UQ's Rees Power, took out first place at Falling Walls finale in Berlin and was named the 2019 uh, Young Innovator of the Year, so quite an accomplishment. Um, Rhys was the lead developer of a patent pending process that turns glass that cannot be recycled into sodium silicate, a uh, valuable industrial feedstock. And as we've heard, we're lucky enough today to have uh, Clara Jiang, who won a, a second prize in the national competition, and really, uh, really pleased to have you here too, Clara. This event, I think, doesn't only help people develop their individual communication skills, very important for doing that. But it also helps uh, drive networks of connection, uh, both within our community here, the welcoming of Queensland uh, universities here is important for that dimension, but it goes national and then it goes international. And I think the more we do that, the more we share across those boundaries, uh, the better off the world's gonna be. And it will help us, particularly for an institution like ours, uh, to see us playing a critical part in, in shaping and developing and improving the world, it's an important step to it. And I really do want to re-articulate UQ's commitment to the scheme. It's a terrific innovation. And thank you to all of our people here that are helping uh, put this together. And uh, can I offer my best wishes to the contestants? You're probably getting very nervous now, very stressed, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure you do brilliantly. So I hope you have a fabulous day. I hope you connect, hope you mix, and best wishes for the future. So thank you and welcome all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aidan. I'd now like to invite Professor Michael Rosamond, uh, Director of the Centre for Future Enterprise and Professor of Innovation Systems at QUT and Honorary uh, Consul of the Federal Republic of Germany here in Queensland. Thank you. 
thank you very much, Caroline, also for taking care of, of us today. Uh, Provost, the Aiden, uh, Lauren, wonderful to see you, and, and Serena, thank you so much for your presence and the ongoing support. Uh, dear panel members, uh, executive dean, head of schools, but most of all, dear all, and in particular, the tremendous talent that looks forward to the most three-minute uh, excited, excitement that we'll have for a long time. Um, the first Falling Walls Lab in Brisbane took place in, in 2019, and I'm tremendously grateful to the University of Queensland that you facilitate uh, today, from, from the actual space to the executive support, uh, to from the MC to panel members, to the audience, to the speakers. Uh, but most of all, I really like to start by highlighting what, what Tamara, Jessica, and the entire team have done. So uh, you, you see the tip of an iceberg, and the iceberg is very, very big. So I'm tremendously grateful, uh, Tamara and Jessica, what you've done in the past to make this a possibility. So from, from the German um, government, from, from the ambassador, Dr. Markus Ederer, uh, my dear colleague, uh, Julia Kauter, and myself, I, I can't even express in words how grateful I am that you continue this, this kind of conversation. Um, the Berlin Wall, as you highlighted, uh, Ayn, um, was the outcome of, of a lot of different activities. And I think the, the metaphor matters today as well. Uh, we all believe that you're tremendously successful in the science you do, uh, and that's necessary, but often not, not sufficient for success in life. And, and similar to the, to the Berlin Wall, the Berlin Wall uh, fell because of ambition, audience, and assistance. Um, it's important when we, when we start our research that with sort of confidence, uh, we approach this in a very ambitious way. And a wall is only falling if we're ambitious. And so I encourage you to think about how could you amplify the ambition and, and think about how tremendous the impact could be. Uh, second, uh, when people wanted to bring the wall to an end, they needed an audience, they needed to communicate uh, to, to those who couldn't see what's possible. Uh, and as, as Aidan highlighted, science communication is, is so important because it's it's kind of key scaffolding to, to what you do. And today is another opportunity to maybe less nurture the scientific core, but the scientific ability uh, to communicate what you do so brilliantly. Uh, last uh, but not least, and I think Clara can talk about it, um, this is also about building a peer-to-peer -peer network. I, I want that you go home with new friends um, and, and you walk much further when you walk together. So this is also about uh, mutual assistance. Um, this is not about competition. I, I want that you go home and think this was one of the best days in my life. Uh, so, so like Aiden, I, I look very much forward uh, to be inspired by you. But a bit, bit like the Berlin Wall, this is about ambition, finding the right audience, and assisting each other. So thank you again from all of us to all of you here at, at UQ. But most of all, I hope you enjoy today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. I'd now like to invite Serena Hobbin, um, Director or Acting Director of Study Queensland for Trade Investment Queensland and Four Lang Walls Lab Brisbane event partner to say a few words. Thanks, Serena. Thank you, Carolyn. Good morning. Distinguished guests, Professor Aidan Byrne, Provost, University of Queensland, Professor Michael Rosman, Director of the Centre of Future Enterprise and Professor for Innovation Systems at the Business School, Queensland University of Technology and Honorary Consul, Federal Republic of Germany in Queensland, Julia Kaut, Head of Science and Innovation, German Embassy, Canberra, and Dr. Clara Jang, 2022 Falling Wars Lab National Winner, and all my fellow judging panel members here today. Um, as you've heard, my name is Serena Hobbin and I'm the Acting Director of Study Queensland in Trade and Investment Queensland. Study Queensland is again honoured to be the event partner for the Falling Walls Lab Brisbane event this year and in that capacity I also very warmly welcome you to the event today. May I also start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we gather this morning, the Yuggera and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also extend those respects to any First Nations peoples here today. Study Queensland is a business unit within Trade and Investment Queensland and our role is to promote Queensland as a premier study destination throughout the world and a preferred partner for teaching, research, innovation. And we support students while they're here in Queensland on their study journey. Queensland has strong links with Germany at the government level and through higher education institutions. Study Queensland, we ourselves have a Director of Research Partnerships based in Frankfurt, Miss Henriette Puck, who is charged with fostering research collaboration between Queensland and Germany. 
and we see particular opportunities for these collaborations to occur in areas such as bioeconomy, defence and aerospace, environmental sciences, health, energy and cybersecurity. For example, as you may be aware, in May last year, the Queensland Government signed a joint declaration of intent um, for cooperation, sorry, in bioeconomy with the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research to help expand our bio-based research and industry. Study Queensland's support for the Falling Walls competition strategically aligns with our new Queensland International Education and Training Strategy. The competition highlights the quality, diversity and passion of our most innovative minds. It not only provides an opportunity for the winners here in Queensland to compete at the national final in Canberra, but as you've already heard, a further opportunity to participate in the Global Falling Walls Conference in Berlin. It provides international development and diversification to all participants and showcases Queensland as a global leader of research expertise. I really look forward to hearing the valuable three minutes from each researcher participating here today at the competition. The incredible re three minutes that could possibly change your life in the world. All the very best to each of you for the competition today. And thank you very much to the team here at the University of Queensland for all your hard work in organising the event. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. And now for some added inspiration before we kick things off, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Clara Zhang, the 2022 Falling, Lab, Falling Walls Lab national winner who competed um, in Berlin last November to say a few words. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Clara and I'm a postdoc at the Institute for Molecular Biosciences here at UQ. It's great to be back at this event, um, this time feeling much less nervous than I was last year. Um, and in fact, when I signed up for the Falling Walls Lab last year, I was less than one year out of my PhD and had just moved, um, changed fields into um, psychiatric and cardiovascular genomics. So as a very early career researcher, I was very eager to show off my new research and was also craving the opportunities to um, connect with other scientists. And the Falling Walls Lab gave me the opportunity to do exactly that, and in fact, much more. And as Michael said, um, participating at the Falling Walls Science Summit in Berlin last year was indeed one of the best days of my life, and it's still a memory that um, I cherish. And at the um, Falling Walls Science Summit, not only did I have the opportunity to present my findings and vision to other scientists um, from around the world, I was also able to make some very valuable connections with not only scientists, but also entrepreneurs from diverse fields. Um, in fact, um, a few people actually reached out to me after um, watching my presentation at the Falling Wars Science Summit, and um, which has um, produced a few collaboration opportunities. So the, particip the participation at the Falling Wars Lab was indeed a one of the biggest milestones in my career so far. And so um, it's really great to be back here. And I just want to say to all the um, finalists this year that great job for getting uh, here, for signing up in the first place. That's the hard part. And I really hope that you enjoy this, this experience. And um, yeah, at the end, I just would like to thank uh, Michael and Hans, who were incredible mentors last year. I would also like to thank the Falling Awards Foundation for this opportunity, as well as Study Queensland, the German Embassy, and um, Urex. And I think I got everyone. Um, well, sorry if I forgot anyone, but um, I would just like to thank them for their generous support and sponsorship, which make this um, journey really special. Thank you. Thanks so much, Clara. Now, uh, before we do start, I'd like to also briefly introduce um, our judging panel that we have with us today. So in addition to Michael and Serena, who you've already heard from, we have Julia Kauter, the head of science and innovation from the German Embassy. We also have Professor Nina Mitter, Director of the Centre of Horticultural Science uh, from Coffee here at UQ. We have uh, Nimrod Clayman, the Head of Ventures here at UQ. We have Professor Charlotte Brownlow, the Associate Dean for the Graduate, Graduate School from the University of Southern Queensland. And we also have um, Kim Castell, the director of the Andrew and Liveris Academy for Innovation and Leadership here at UQ. And our judges are just uh, sitting on the right there. 
So please thank me, join me in thanking all of our judges, our guests, everybody who's um, provided some opening remarks and uh, looking forward to getting this underway. All right, so how it works. Each presenter will have three minutes um, to make their case and explain the wall that's in their way, how it can be overcome and the impact that will have. Um, the judging panel will then have a few moments to ask some questions of the presenters uh, and their um, responses will be weighted on three criteria, breakthrough factor, relevance impact and structure and performance. So the hard part is just showing up and you guys have done that. So well done here. Enjoy the next part. You've got three minutes each and without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our first presenter Hamanchi Galaya and the presentation Breaking the Wall of Inequitable Education. Thank you. What if you could travel back in time? Where would you like to go? Maybe a million years ago to discover dinosaurs or 30 years ago to let your family know where to invest. But what if I told you some of us have actually been in a classroom from almost a century ago? As evidence, I present to you these two images. It will quickly become apparent that besides a change in uniform and some gender inclusions, Kenyan students continue to study in an education system from the colonial era, with 95% of our schools taking a teacher-centric and theory-based approach to education. Students are often left disconnected between the classroom and the real world. What this does is showcase critical pathways such as STEM subjects as boring, tedious, and uninspiring which means students shy away from these rewarding careers and at ages as young as 12 years old do not see its importance. What this means is it consequently impedes socioeconomic development, which today has led to 36% of our population to continue to live below the poverty line. But what if simple activities of frugal science can help Kenyan students be inspired? What if making slime making prosthetic arm models or designing circuits can inspire the next Kenyan chemistry major or engineer or artificial intelligence master. In line with UN's fourth sustainable development goal, I am tackling the educational inequality by simply reimagining how we do STEM education so that we can raise the aspirations and life chances of young Kenyans. Our model is very simple. We partner with industry and train local ambitious young leaders to deliver our customized curriculum designed with expert input in mid and high income schools. We then take the income generated from such programs towards STEM outreach in low income areas where there is a greater need for such a subject and such an impact. So far, we've already supported 1,500 students through various partnerships, including training 200 students for free in coding with partnerships with Tech Kids Africa and Google. And while we have been named as rising impact makers within Africa, this is just a small ripple in the vast ocean. While the world is imagining the future, a Kenyan child is still stuck in the past. And I'll leave you with this one last thought. We say it takes a village to raise a child but we often forget that it will take the same child to elevate that village. And today, if we do not change the inequitable access to education, perhaps a Kenyan child might not just need a time machine, but an alternate reality where we can meet our peers on a fairer ground in order to reach our full potential. Thank you. We now have time for a few questions from the panel. Who would like to go first? Yes. Thanks, Manchi. That was great. Um, so, focus on Kenya to start. Yes. What kind of scale? What kind of scope is there for broader impact beyond that? That initial starting niche. Oh, absolutely. So, Kenya, because I'm from Kenya, just for context, um, there is a lot of impact. So, within uh, Nairobi alone. We have about 75 schools that are privately owned that are in mid and high income range. And this is, if you look at the wider scope of things, there's about 66,000, uh, sorry, 666,000 students. Uh, and as we trickle down from our service obtainable market from the total, 
What we're targeting in the next few years is just the 10 to 20% of this market, which is about 20,000 students. And that is paying customers. For every paying customer, we can actually, for three paying customers, we can support one child for free. So if we look at the domino effect of scaling up, there is quite a lot of potential within Nairobi alone. That's not even to say all, this country, all the cities around Kenya and then in the vast picture of Africa. Uh, wonderful presentation. I love your passion. Um, I, I like the business model. Tell me, what's the scientifically most challenging uh, hurdle you have to climb? The scientifically most challenging hurdle is finding talent locally who understand science, who can communicate science. Because the way our infrastructure is set up, the ambition of every young Kenyan is to leave the country, get better paying jobs elsewhere. So for us, the, the technical challenge was definitely finding young talent, helping them and upskilling them. But in addition to that, there's a lot of societal misunderstanding, I would say, because our, the way in which our education system, like I said, it's colonial era, we still think, be book smart, get your good grades, and then you know, you're set for life. But nobody prepares you on thinking about applying science. So we're not creating innovation, so we don't have the role models. And because we don't have the role models, it's just a, you know, a vicious cycle now. Any other? Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd now like to introduce uh, Yu Han Lu and the presentation Breaking the Wall of Legume Nitrogen Fixation. 100 years ago, nitrogen fertilizer was invented. It was a breakthrough to increase food production and feed the global population today. However, fertilizer is not friendly to the environment. Half of it is lost through the soil, contaminates water, and discharges greenhouse gas. Nitrous oxide is 300 times more harmful than carbon dioxide. As you can see, the environmental impacts of fertilizer were significant. Nature has a better solution that we can learn from. Legume plants. Most of you may already have encountered them from your daily food, like soy milk, plant-based meat, or even baked beans. They are nutritious with many health benefits for you and our planet. 60 million years ago, legumes developed a symbiotic relationship with bacteria that can turn atmospheric nitrogen gas into nitrogen the plant can use. This process is known as nitrogen fixation. If we improve nitrogen fixation in legume crops, we can increase food production, increase sustainability, and reduce synthetic fertilizer use. This nitrogen fixation occurs in special root organs named nodules. But nodule development is complex, like a genetic symphony performance. Like the symphony, you need different instruments or molecules. Some molecules are large, while others, like the ones my PhD focus on, are small. These small molecules are called peptides. There are thousands of these peptides in plants. Similar to how humans identified those only 1% DNA difference from chimpanzees, my project identified those nodule-specific ones in legumes using a genetic family tree through a bioinformatic analysis. Then we further used the molecular biology method to study the peptide function. We looked where the peptides are in nodules and what happens if they're too much or too little. I can tell you, it's all about maintaining a balance as with anything in life. This work will help us to know if my peptides are the instrument needed to improve the nitrogen fixation genetic symphony. Learning more about legumes will help to develop even better crops, providing more food on our plate and fuel our cars. Breaking the wall of biological nitrogen fixation offers the best solution to support our environment. By eating more legume-based food, we all can contribute to a sustainable agriculture. Thank you. Any questions in the chair? Nina. Yeah, I might ask you. Thank you. Great, <laughs> present, great, great presentation. And yeah, very important, uh, absolutely, now that when we are thinking of carbon emissions and reducing emissions and fertilizers and important to us for our Great Barrier Reef as well. My question to you is, 
you um, mentioned that you are working on, uh, you know, understanding the peptides, which will then help in nitrogen fixation. Where do you see the translation of that work? Like after identification of those peptides, how are you looking at translating them to make an impact? Yeah, so that's a great, a great, fantastic question. Um, so we normally like using this. Uh, firstly, we focus on this molecular biology method. So like uh, after we doing this uh, genetic modified plants to see the gene function. So we normally using like this uh, relative transcription uh, method, like a qPCR, to see how this translation works. And then further than that, we also focus on to checking whether this gene have the function really impacts the phenotype. So currently, gladly, um, we have this very positive results can show these peptides, although small, but its translated result shows they does regulate the root and nodule development. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? If not, can I indulge yes, in one more? Yes, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Uh, you know, there are, like, in, in terms of nitrogen fixation, because that's your topic, there are uh, innovations happening, even things that people are looking at, if cereals can fix nitrogen fixation, yeah. you know, using the same models. So have you thought about that, that your peptides can, are they legume-specific, or they can have a broader value? Yes. So that actually is a before my PhD, like I talked to my uh, supervisor April. So we were very fantastic, uh, like fascinating to know like whether this legume fascinating works uh, in like other cereal crops. Because you know, for our daily life, cereals plays a big role for our, you know, the food uptake. And then, um, so actually they have a similar, uh, we have this because from the genetic evolution uh, perspective, so everything have the similar things. Uh, so we have found like uh, this peptide um, have some um, in uh, the from the the gene evolution. They have some uh, relative to some other cereals, but this aspect. So from our lab, so because we are focusing on the legumes, we haven't really done this aspect. Yeah, but we are keening to using this peptide legume knowledge to imp uh, to apply for the cereals and then to make a bigger uh, impact for agriculture. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Now, next up, we have uh, Mr. Mahmoud Abu Salim and the Breaking the Wall of Recycled Cardboard Construction presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. No place in the world is immune to disasters, whether they are natural or human-made. As a result, millions of people are displaced from their homes day after day. Currently, the number of forcibly displaced people has worldwide has exceeded 100 million. These individuals simply need a roof to sustain their lives and enable immediate recovery in order to prevent long-term psychological damage. Despite numerous attempts to achieve low-cost, comfortable, and efficient post-disaster housing, but the results are still falling short of government's expectations, as the main problems they face are limited to cost, local supply availability, timeliness, and the need for more than just a roof. Thus, it is evident that rising disasters necessitate invaluable post-disaster housing. Therefore, I am here to dismantle barriers, preventing the introduction of cardboard as an alternative material to the next generation of post-disaster housing, where cardboard is considered the most basic material that can be converted into valuable commodities due to its ubiquitous presence. So why, so why do we overlook cardboard potential beyond packaging field? This can be achieved by repurposing scrap cardboard boxes and combining them with compatible material like timber with appropriate manufacturing technique to develop cardboard composite, which is like this, which can be used in the construction of both disaster housing. This composite comprises the two most readily available material in the world, and we can fabricate the longer size of this composite by $23, with 65% of it being cost-free. In the current stage of testing, this composite can withstand a load of up to 1.5 tons, which we can raise a regular size of car on two beams. By utilizing this innovative structure, we have the potential to provide housing with various designs to be assembled on site 
with a fraction of the effort that required for conventional one. Finally, I hope that every displaced person will have access to cardboard house to live in without considering disposal of these houses when they are no longer needed. Thank you. Questions from the judging panel? Tim. I'm, I'm just curious about the manufacturing process and shipping, because it seems like you'd have advantages in both of those areas as well with this technology. So you are talking about the uh, manufacturing and what? Uh, shipping or oh, transportation. Okay, yeah. 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 So really, in the start of uh, like uh, the, the trials, the start uh, the trials of the um, project, uh, I am trying to go ahead like with the, the most easiest way in the manufacturing technique, because there is already uh, some trials before. And there is one of the like cardboard house, which is called Wickel House. It's already built, but it's need a very special equipment to be built, like with a frame and special setup. So we're trying to go ahead as we are directing, directing our application to the post disaster housing. That meaning we need someone in the field to be built or assembled at least. So our technique more in the simple way, we are trying to repurposing, uh, repurposing scrap cardboard boxes or processing them by uh, using a very general thing, which is like, look like the table saw, which can be in the field, and combine them directly, like, uh, conv uh, like converted them to block laminated cardboard, combine to them the most cheap and the smallest thickness of plywood available in the markets, so directly can be just a glued and go ahead with, to be on the side. If it is already assembled, so just like we, there are different techniques can be taken in the design, and regarding of that, the people needed to be on site to, to do it just directly to be assembled and just go ahead with it. I make it short. I, I like the idea. I try to work out, is this just a smart idea yeah, or is there deep science involved? What is it? Is this a smart idea yeah. or is this, is this a really, an yeah. outcome of a deep scientific investigation? Really, if like this idea is already invented <coughs> by the um, US military in 1947. Uh, so really, there is an idea for utilizing paper-based structure. Yeah. But the problem in how do you want to go ahead with the fabrication and the best way to be utilized in life? This is the most important thing. And even because we are utilizing scrap cardboard, so that's meaning we don't have a reason impregnated or whatever to be protected. So we are trying to know, like, w by combining the most compatible material, which is the cardboard everywhere, and the timber, which is nowadays it's going, most of the building is going with that technique to go with ahead with timber buildings. So by combining them, how much like, how much load, how much design, and how much life, lifespan can we get? Because as you know, temporary structure board for post disaster housing, they need between six months up to three years. So just yesterday, I started like would go ahead to, because everyone is just asking about the lifespan of this innovative structure. So we're trying to get the lifespan when the worst case here, like in Brisbane, with, we are talking about the temperature minimum of about five degrees, maximum nowadays is 27, relative humidity around the 24, and maximum around 96, which is not a joke like for a cardboard. So yeah, this is the main thing. Excellent, thank you. We might yeah, have to leave it there so thank we can you. continue, but thank you. And, and surely points for bringing props with you as well, so well done. <laughs> Excellent. I would now like to introduce uh, Mohammed Salam and the Breaking the Wall of Sustainable Aquaculture's presentation. Hi, good morning, everyone. So, um, life. It's everything about equilibrium. So imagine in a perfect ecosystem, you can see large organisms like me, living with microorganisms together at environment in a beautiful, harmonious, beneficial relationship. And once this balance is disturbed, then a disease will occur. In aquaculture, the late stage infection can massively lead to losses for farmers and investors locally, globally, everywhere. Then the only on-site diagnostic kits can provide a very limited and poor capacity to identify a pathogen. And in the same time, the only way is to do the right job is to send it to centralized lab facilities, which has a pain in logistics. 
So a wall must be fallen. Among all molecular diagnostic techniques, we believe that LAMP is the best way to go. We have three pairs of primers, complementary sequence, that can identify a single genetic fingerprint for a certain pathogen, combined with, a, with, with an isothermal amplification process, so we know how much energy we're going to spend. And all together can bring a very low limit of detection and an accurate and sensitive way to identify a certain pathogen. Bringing this with our device, hardware, software developed in-house at TRL7. So all together, we can generate massive data to reach our five Ps model. It doesn't click. Stop the counter. <laughs> click, okay. So the five Ps, it's a purpose driven, which means we know we identify our target, our pathogens and then we can easily monitor it all the time. Then personal and participatory, so actually our clients are our partners, not just an ordinary customer. And then all together we bring this data to feed an expert system where we can produce a productive, preventive, predictive and preventive measures. So I would say that our, thanks to the Egyptian mythology again, our target is to create such an expert system. It doesn't work. Wait. Such expert system, if we believe that at a certain point, we will reach an Ouroboros model where we don't need the physical testing anymore, or what we're going to do, it's just we can go 100% digital to prevent and predict a multifactorial function of a region, of a season, of a disease, of a pathogen. And then we can have a sustainable agriculture industry. Thank you, and I'm happy to receive your questions. <laughs> you see, what? You could have helped. <laughs> so, questions? Yes, please. Nimrod. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. That was really good. Just for uh, clarification, so, so this testing is done in the lab, not, not no, in no, the... No, 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 on-site. It's on a real-time monitoring on-site. We have a manifold, we have a microfluidics pumping, and everything is run real-time all the time. So Excellent. this is it. I don't need a central lab facility. I'm bringing the lab to the site, not the site to the lab. And everyone can do the testing, like the farmer without experience, no expertise? Zero experience. You just need to, actually, if you look to the data that we are generating, the customer himself, we will train him to receive and to interpret the data, but he doesn't, he doesn't need to, le to, to learn how to run anything. It's a fully walk away system. But all the data will go to the cloud where we have this Ouroboros model, which thanks to the engineers, brilliant engineers, we are, we are a quartet, we are a fantastic team. So that expert system will generate that function for that farmer at that place, at that season, at that time, all the, the parameter, the big data thing, we mine and we, 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 we recognize the pattern. And when you have the pattern, so the farmer can say, within that day, after one year from now, two years from now, please be prepared Maybe you have a white spot uh, virus. Be prepared, maybe you have an infection. Why? Because your neighbor, which is 100 kilometer away, got the infection, and the cloud will have this uh, lovely map, like a heat map, geographical one. So the system will not just be in service of the farmers, will be in service of the investors and the government and the country. So we, we, we think global, inshallah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I'm, so I'm familiar with LAMP because LAMP I am is LAMP. used in plant <laughs> diagnostics yes. as well and those kids. So would like to know what is the innovative element in your breakthrough? It's, voila. The innovative things is LAMP, it's a very well established. So it's an advantage, not a disadvantage. So we are relying on something that I don't need the cycling, the ramping thing for the PCR. It's an isothermal. So I know exactly which temperature the do the annealing and the amplification. So it's very well established. The three pairs of primers means it's super selective and specific. And the innovation is binding or combining the data coming from the lamp together 
with the, all the sensor that will detect the salinity, the pH, the temperature, in the software that will digest all this data to generate a machine learning algorithm that can make an Ouroboros model for preventive and predictive mission. So it's a package. It's the hardware software package and the machine learning computational engine, which is outside. OK, excuse me, I will add a little bit more. Right now, LAMP, you are detecting a color change. I'm thinking of, actually, we're working on it now, to have a fluorescent signal. Because the color and to, to, to measure the hue saturation is not as specific as detecting a fluorescent signal. So maybe within one year, two years from now, I have generation two, and I don't need a lamp. I need just to amplify a fluorescent signal. And then a camera will tell you this is at one copy per milliliter, two copy per milliliter. So it's super early, because I cannot disinfect the farms. I'd like to keep the microorganisms, the good microorganisms, the natural microbial flora. So I don't want to get rid of the microorganisms. There are the, the probiota and the microbiota and all these lovely things. But I would like to have an early detection, early enough to get the right measures. So if you are asking about the innovation, it's the hardware, software, machine learning. And one day, very soon, I'm having a fantastic Ouroboros model. It's an Egyptian mythology, so thanks to the country. <laughs> Excellent. Please, more. <laughs> I love this. You, very quickly, Michael. Just a very quick one. Uh, you talk about the big team. What is your particular contribution to the team? I am, I'm old. So I am the microbiologist. I'm the bioengineer, and I'm the executive scientist. And they are the brilliant minds. So we are like a quartet. You cannot say the viola is the team leader or the cello or the violin. So we are in harmonious things. So we are one big body doing the same target. Thank you. You see, they are lovely. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy that. Excellent. All right. And next up, we have Dr. Emma Ann Carlson and the presentation Breaking the Wall of Cancer Therapy. I found that treating cancer can be a bit like trying to get into a house where the front door is locked. Conventional chemotherapy is like a bulldozer. Sure, you're going to get inside, but goodness, aren't you creating a lot of harm in the process? Monoclonal antibody therapy is a key to the lock. It offers targeted therapy, the key, that directly attaches to receptors on the cancer cell surface, the lock, to kill that cell alone. But haven't we all had a dodgy lock? It's the right key to the right lock, but for some reason, that door won't open no matter how many times you jiggle it. Well, that's the case for a lot of our monoclonal antibodies, as only 15 to 30% of my patients currently respond. And boy, these keys aren't cheap, as it's estimated that the average cost to Australia per year is in excess of $355 million for these patients that are non-responders. So how can we predict who has a dodgy lock? Well, our lab have demonstrated that patients who fail to internalize their receptors, so therefore have more receptors on the cell surface in a particular pattern, respond better to therapy than those who don't. And using this information, we found a lock smith. Prochlorperazine, or PCZ, is a medication that I already prescribe in the hospital for nausea and vomiting. What we've shown is that at higher doses, PCZ can temporarily inhibit the internalization of those receptors, therefore turning non-responders into responders. To prove this work clinically, I looked at patients with head and neck cancer, and highlighted in green, you can see a significant increase in the receptor expression after the infusion of PCZ. We did a phase one safety trial and proved that this was safe with no significant adverse effects. And to our delight, even though it's just a safety trial, we showed regression of metastatic disease that was previously refractory to even platinum chemotherapy. We are breaking down the wall of monoclonal antibody resistance for the 70% of my patients who currently don't respond to therapy. And we're currently extending this to other cancers, as I'm currently recruiting to a clinical trial where I look at the combination of PCZ with trastuzumab, a medication that I use to treat HER2-positive breast cancer. My favorite part of this is, is it won't be through the development of a novel medication that will cost tens of millions of dollars in R&D and a significant environmental impact. They'll be through reaching into our own pharmacies 
and repurposing an already PBS-approved medication that costs just $20 a vial. Thank you. Fantastic. Some questions from the judging panel. Julia. Thank you for the presentation, actually, of course, a very important topic, so uh, very interesting. Um, just wondering, I'm not from the field, you know, um, that you're working in, so the medicine you just um, mentioned, do you know if it's also used, available in other countries? Is this something very specific in Australia? Uh, absolutely. So monoclonal antibody therapy was actually developed by Milstein and his German PhD student, which is quite ironic. <laughs> Um, in the 90s, and they won the Nobel Prize for that. And it's commercially available in the standard of care for a lot of um, cancers that we treat. But unfortunately, you know, those who respond, it's fantastic. They love it. You know, patients hate chemotherapy. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of people don't respond. So we're just trying to tackle that hurdle that we have currently. So I, I'm just uh, curious about the range of cancers that this would potentially work with. Oh, fantastic. So monoclonal antibody therapy is currently first line um, for things like HER2-positive breast cancer, so that's trastuzumab. Cetuximab is used to treat head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. It's also the standard of care for various lymphomas and leukemias. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. And next up, uh, we have Sarah, Susan, Jacob, and the presentation, Breaking the World of Food Sovereignty. Thank you. When was the last time you had a warm curry with turmeric for dinner, or an energy drink with guarana to help power you through your workout, or a, or a smoothie made with uh, berries and chia seeds to help get your day started, or even a cheeky macadamia nut cookie from the local subway as a sweet treat? These are all ingredients that were added to the global food system only about 15 to 20 years ago. But they aren't new or novel. In fact, they are older than the collective age of this room. Turmeric, an ingredient native to Southeast Asia, was used as a traditional ingredient and medicine discovered through Ayurveda. Guarana was discovered by the Tupi people deep in the Amazon as a quick source of energy. Blackberries, blueberries, cranberries, all of these are integral and discovered by the Great Plains Native Americans. And of course, we all know where macadamia nuts really come from. Today, uh, today I'm here to talk about the pressing issue of food security, along with which we also know that a lot of indigenous communities with uh, debilitating and chronic illnesses no longer consume any of these foods. So it is crucial now more than ever to come up with integrated and inclusive ways to do science. We need to find ways to establish evidence while joining all the dots and taking into account all experiences, those lived by indigenous communities and those established through scientific protocols. In my PhD, I look at wattle seeds or Australia's native legumes. And using these, I try to establish evidence through stories, art, and lived experiences. And we have been able to find, this, find similar evidence in scientific knowledge across food science. We have been able to create products inspired by traditional use, reigniting the comfort of familiar foods and connection to country, bringing the ownership back to the indigenous communities themselves all the way creating pathways for long-lasting impact and economic empowerment. Today, I challenge you to broaden your perspective on what research really means. Because in order to truly achieve food sovereignty through science, we need to acknowledge that knowledge is not just written about in articles, but danced, sung, and celebrated about, drawn and painted about, talked about and passed on to children, but also shared openly and freely to the people with the right curiosity. Thank you. Any questions from the panel? Nimrod. Excellent. Thank you so much for the presentation, and that's uh, fascinating. Um, my question is how you find all this source of knowledge and how you translate it to um, the research part or to the university? Thank you for your question. I think the finding is easier than the translating. 
Because finding, I think, again, you just need to be open to all sorts of information. Because I think in research, we generally tend to focus on written knowledge. So it's really hard to translate oral knowledge. So that is oral and art. Uh, so that is something I'm very interested in and finding ways to incorporate into the articles that I write, which has been a challenge, but I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Nina, do you have a question? Thank you. Um, <laughs> a great talk. Um, just wanted to understand in terms of the relevance and impact of your work beyond, you know, yes, you know, the focus on what at the moment this project, is it kind of a model or a pathway you're developing that we can, others can use? Yes, um, exactly. Making it much broader and looking at the benefit sharing and other kind of aspects yes. when such knowledge is used. Yes, exactly. So I think I would say that I'm trying to develop a framework to develop smarter food design where we actually incorporate more views and more opinions and experiences into the way we develop food products so more people can benefit. Because a lot of the information that we're finding were things that communities knew already. It's just that we're finding evidence in other ways. So if we, if we, uh, if we acknowledge and are open to understanding their experiences and knowledge, I think the path to that will be a lot faster. Michael. Yeah, I've got a follow-up, like, the same question. How can someone in Brazil, China, or Nauru replicate your work? What, what, what do you hand over for them to replicate what you do? Um, so I have a friend who, who did her PhD on banya nuts, and they have a very similar nut that grows in Brazil. So she actually collaborated with indigenous communities in Brazil to develop models that work for both countries. Uh, and so they have a few technologies that they are using, and she's trying to bring them into Australia, so we can try and use that here to, um, to uh, manage the diseases in indigenous banya pines. So I think uh, I would use that example. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'd now like to invite our next presenter, uh, Dr. Tuskeen Janjua and the presentation Breaking the Wall of Brain Cancers. Hello everyone. To brain cancer is an insidious and devastating disease. It kills more children in Australia than any other disease. And the reason for that is the, the presence of blood brain barrier. It presents a formidable wall which prevents therapies from entering the brain. And the therapies that do enter are often uh, uh, pushed out by the blood brain barrier because of these pumps body of stops. And only a limited amount of drugs penetrate from blood to brain and, and then enter into the tumor. As a consequence, uh, patients often have poor survival and uh, poor quality of life and limited, limited chances of survival. Brain cancer such as glioblastoma, uh, often patients have survival of less than 14 months. During my PhD, I developed Silicon nanoparticles, which are our target delivery system. Now, these nanoparticles have three key features. Firstly, they're ultra small, uh, less than 30 nanometers in size, which means they can penetrate the blood to barrier. They are also very porous in structure, which means we can load a lot of cargo. They have a high percolating effect, so we won't pick the drug for small. And lastly, they have a target absorption that attached to them, or vector brain. Now, whose receptors are over expressed for both the brain. And the tumor. As a consequence, we can not only try with the blood brain barriers, but also entry into the tumor. Now, imagine a world where now imagine a world where we can actually reduce the survival, uh, improve the survival of patients with brain cancer by by harnessing the full potential of nanoparticles. We can achieve that reality. Now, the impact of my project is quite vast. The reason for that is, well, firstly, by enabling targeted delivery, we can harness the full potential of these nanoparticles and enable unprecedented targeted precision drug delivery. The nanoparticles that I have developed have the potential to not only reduce the side effects that patients often experience from chemotherapies, because they're now in the brain rather than in the, in the setting outside in the blood system, but also we can reduce the side effects. <laughs> 
So you can reduce the side effects and also improve the survival with the ultimate aim of uh, improving brain cancer therapy. By embracing the re reality of uh, nanoparticles, we can actually hope to improve the, the survival and offer patients a renewed hope for uh, longer survival and uh, increased life, lifespan. Um, yeah, so it's a, a, a reality waiting to be embraced. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've now got Sorry, a few questions. <laughs> and Nimrod. Yes, yes, I can. Great presentation, and the impact is quite amazing. Uh, so, can you tell us at what uh, stage are you? Like, how far from clinical trials, for example? Uh, so, I've, I've made the, during my PhD, I was making these nanoparticles. So, I've, I've developed the nanoparticles, I've tested them um, in in vitro and also in vivo models. So. Um, in, in, in cell cultures, they show to be more effective against the brain cancers. I was specifically working on glioblastoma. Um, now, in cell, animal models, we've shown that they can actually enter into the brain of the mice a lot more than other therapies can. So uh, now the next step will be to test in uh, patient-derived uh, glioblastoma models. So getting patients, um, you know, we're working with uh, PA Hospital and Children Can Children's Institute in uh, Sydney. And uh, so we've, we'll get the patient cancer models, and then we'll test them in mice or grow them. The other model we're testing them in is um, spontaneous glioblastoma models. So the tumor spontaneously grows in, in mice, and we can treat it. So the blood-brain barrier is intact, so we can actually assess um, how it enters the brain. After these studies are done, that's what my postdoc will be about. After these studies are done, then we can potentially go into clinical trials. So probably five, six years, assuming everything goes well. And our final presenter for today, Natalie Sivan-Krisman, and breaking the wall of women entrepreneurship in bio and medtech. Good afternoon. Presenting the importance and relevance of Aguardia. Biotechnology is one of the industries that has the lowest numbers of women entrepreneurs. The current data show a concerning reality. Only 7.3% of women in biomedtech industry are owned by women. This underrepresentation not only limits women economic empowerment, but also difficult innovation and progress in critical health challenge. The consequence of the lack of women entrepreneurs in biomedtech generated a loss of $250 million in Australia, which represents a loss of 0 0.02 in GDP. The social and eco economic loss is the lack of innovation, the lack of talent, the lack of progress, economic progress in this industry. The increment in female entrepreneurship should not only focus on increasement the in number of female students enrollment, because in the university field of STEM was 35%, but only 29% for a business. In contrast, in biotechnology, where 50%, but only 10% become entrepreneur. Introducing our grand bacon research, we aim to reduce the underrepresentation of women in biometech. First, analyze the factors influencing entrepreneurial intention using the entrepreneurial mindset. Second, identify the barriers using the entrepreneurial orientation. And finally, exposing the strategies used by successful women entrepreneurs in biometech. We seek to empower and support the growth of women in this field. Our research have the potential to drive economic growth, foster innovation, and create a more diverse and inclusive biotechnology industry. Together, let's break the barrier and unlock the potential of women entrepreneurs in biotech. Because if we support women scientists to become entrepreneurs, we can increase the economy in Australia by 70 million and globally by 3 billion. The practical application of our research will be the development of a platform focusing incentivized entrepreneurial intention in undergrad, doctoral, postdoctoral, and academic by translating scientific research and patent into viable business opportunities. Will be integrated by gender-sensitive business education, multidisciplinary link, pitch communication skills, and we are passing from the ideation stage to the ground stage. At the moment, what we have been developed has been a international validation and have participants in, 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 in Young Solution Program in 2022, uh, University World Startup in 2022 by University of Copenhagen, and find a member of the Queen Commonwealth Network. Now, let's make a big revolution in biotech industry. Thank you so much. Thank you for your
conversation. I just wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about what you found some of the barriers were for the women uh, moving into these industries. Yes, we have three, uh, three principal barriers. The first is the, that is a male-dominated industry. The, the only 10% of investment in biometech are for focus to women. The second is the lack of, a, a, the lack of opportunities in, in this industry for women because not only is the glass ceiling, they, they don't have so many opportunities as men have, but also the sticky floor. The mindset for women in this industry is lower than in the other industries. That is why we need to incentivize and help them that they are powerful for women, that they can make a change, and in the future, uh, reduce future health impacts like we have in this pandemic. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you all to the uh, amazing presenters for sharing your views with us and your visions for how to overcome some of these challenges. Um, what we're gonna do now, the judging panel is going to step out of the room for a moment to deliberate um, and work out the three finalists um, that we will then announce later um, today. In the meantime, we're gonna do a Q&A session with the presenters, so I would like to, um, also invite Lauren Stevenson, Director of the Office of the Queensland Chief Scientist, to join us up here with the presenters for the Q&A. We're just going to take a moment to rearrange some chairs so we've got um, time to sit. So please bear with us and then we'll um, reconvene shortly. up any thoughts that you might have. Look, can we start with you, Himanshi? Yeah. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about what you think? You already did tell us a bit about the community impact of your research, but beyond the immediate engagement of the students, what's going to be the impact on the families and the wider community? We've definitely engaged with the, the communities, the parents, the teachers. Uh, one thing that's uh, very exciting is parents also are getting excited about STEM. So sometimes we have activities and they will come along to it and they're like, oh my God, why didn't we have this as kids? So one thing that has happened as a translation of that is that excitement is trickling down into the community. So parents are more supportive of their children trying things at home. So a lot of science is testing and doing and exploding, as I say. But the bigger impact of it is, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, you know young Kenyans with great potential, we do these degrees that we think are useful, and then there is no jobs in the market. But if communities change and then there's a demand, we have more uh, power in terms of leverage for at a socioeconomic level. And uh, what I'm seeing is my youngest kids are four, so by the time they're probably at university, uh, they'll be you know about another 20 years maybe before they can actually become the scientists or you know, the engineers that support the economy. But these conversations within communities is putting a pressure on the government and uh, systemic level also that we need infrastructure, we need investment, that sort of thing. Obviously, our impact is so far very low, but the partnerships that we're having is also creating critical conversations. And partnering, you know, what, one of the things we do is we've coined a word called collaboration collaboration over competition. And so even though there are so many other organizations working in this space, we come together to collectively leverage our power. So I think the long-term impact is definitely socioeconomic development, increasing the quality of life, but above all, I think, giving a more level playing field, especially in education for our next generation. That's fantastic. And I think one of the things that will do is help to influence the influencers so the parents will see the benefits and that will influence them to continue to encourage their students and, and the other young people they, they come into contact with. Tuskeen, your, your research project is amazing, um, but that is a really big problem, the brain cancers in children and the death rate. What is your vision behind this, the problem that you're solving? What is your vision for a successful future? I'm developing a drug delivery system. So 
You can basically put any sort of drug in it. Um, uh, I'm currently working on brain cancers, but potentially we could use this to deliver um, other chemicals, other substances that don't go into the brain, so for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. It's just basically a, a, a delivery system, like a cargo, basically a car that can go into the brain. Uh, Therapies to brain are really difficult to treat. Um, any 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 central nervous system disorder, they are very tricky just because the blood-brain barrier exists. Um, you compare it with breast cancers or other other you know other, other parts of the body where uh, diseases happen. The brain is more trickier just because of the presence of this blood-brain barrier. Um, it's it's good. It's protective. We need a barrier in our brain. We don't want all the toxins and everything that we eat to go into our brain. So it's a protective feature. But the problem is it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Um, you can uh, not send the therapies that you want. So I'm just, uh, my vision is to develop this sort of uh, delivery system which can be used for multiple different uh, substances. The main challenge was to develop something so small, the size of 30 nanometers. Um, uh, most of the nanoparticles that you might come across, and nanoparticles are actually used currently in clinic at the moment, like. Um, Doxil is a doxorubicin uh, version, which is used for breast cancer, and it's it's a chemo, it's a nanoparticle. It's a, COVID vaccines were nanoparticles as well. The trouble is to get them to the size of thirty nanometers, so that they can or or, or under, so that they can enter the brain. Um, that does not exist yet. It's not it's not clinically approved. So my vision is to um, to further develop this so that it can be used for uh, drug delivery to brain, specifically cancer for now. And then eventually we'll, um, we're already starting to work with Alzheimer's uh, models as well. So maybe in future we can um, start working on other models as well. Well, wow, that's really exciting because not only are the brain cancers in children so devastating, but the other diseases you mentioned are also devastating and affecting more and more people. Yes. Thank you for that extra information. Thank you. Johan, I already know you as a Wonder of Science ambassador, and so I know you, that your inspiration will bring on others, that other students, younger students, be they at school or, or university cohort, will be inspired by, by your example. And I certainly felt that with your presentation today on the uh, nitrogen fixing. What attracted you to apply to pitch at this event? Um. Yeah, so actually, uh, firstly, I would say, um, you know, being a PhD, and then you absolutely love your research topic. So without that enthusiasm, you love your re research topic, you wouldn't finish your PhD, I would say that. Yeah, so absolutely, you know, from this point of view, because I so love it, and then I know I'm struggling with a lot of my project, but I really want to try uh, to tell everyone what I'm doing. So I think if I can let everyone understand what I'm saying, that means I probably can understand my topic better than before. <laughs> yeah, so this is one thing. And so on the other hand, um, you know, like legumes, it's just a, like natural plants. So, and then they are very small and then actually it's very like uh, helpful and uh, um, very like, it can be used uh, uh, in like, it's really like have this practical useness for the farmers growing plants. And then I feel like uh, if I were the legumes, you know, I, I really want to like bring everyone to know the goodness of legumes to the environment. Yeah, so I thought like, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm really want to know like, you know, I, I, I'm doing the legumes, like I want to let everyone know, you know, legumes are nutritious. And then uh, why not, you know, like trying to uh, be in, uh, being customers, we can consume more legumes. And meanwhile, by we eating more legumes, I don't know, farmers has to grow legumes, right? It's like the market chain. And then we all like potentially is helping the environment. So that's I think is the more reason driven me to come here. And then I think the lastly, I hope I can like get um, more like uh, for my rest of PhD. So as the more result come up, so I also can be like being more inspired from this event. So I absolutely believe this sort of event is also helping me to grow a lot. And then I can, you know, can support me to finish my PhD, and then I can get like a more um, useful result to tell the farmers in Stanthorpe I, where I used worked for. So I can tell them, you know, how to do, how to grow legumes, you know, how to um, benefit for the farmers, but also benefit for the global, the whole environment. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> answer because that gives inspiration and spreading the message and promotion, etc. Yeah, I, I think yeah. 
thank you. So I thought like also being one of science, you know, like young science ambassador, this is moment I'm also advertising one of science. Um, absolutely, I think every PhD will have this passion. So, you know, passion the first, and then love your topic, and then we're trying to get more result, like for, for the whole planet. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. that answer. Mahmoud, you, you showed us that you will be responding to many of the challenges facing us today with weather events, et cetera. Are there other uses you could put your technology to? Uh, really, like when I started uh, and start focusing on thinking in like the paper based materials and using of it, um, to, like the, the main focus on using of this type of research is the application. So one of the things that I was focusing on to direct that materials in the most power thing, thing that can be useful regarding of this type of material. So if we have this, like the, the, the material is available everywhere. So, but the main important thing where we can, where, where we are gonna use it, use it. Really there is already like, look like one of the example Wicker House I already mentioned. This is a very business, one of the business like um, companies that can produce us a temporary structure with a very high cost, uh, with a very high cost, like around 82,000 uh, um, US dollar. But our way is not just going to the business. We are focusing on one of the most biggest problems for us. And really, I was not understanding how the problem it is until I went to, with my supervisor to Lismore, which is the area that affected by floods and who is impacted is still up to today, like up today. And when you hear, like when you hear as a, as a student, when you hear from the people and how they are looking to you, it is like, like you are asking yourself, what's going on? Like, you know, you, because if you are as a student, you are not like thinking that that's, oh, you need to place a very big effect of your research on the, in the life. So we are speaking about like, when they mentioned, they are spoken, asking for 300 temporary structures. So we have, we, we ask like, they need a massive, massive like mm -hmm. thing. So completely my thinking in the project is going far away. Like from just, I want to finish the tests because even these, these composites, you are not able just to, to fabricate it and throw it in the, like in the industry. You need to investigate different stages of structural behavior, different stages like axial, transverse, um, exterior, like lateral loads, the snow, the winds, and having appropriate designs. To be able to introduce something for them, even they are accepted because not the excellent in just giving them a roof, because sometimes they're asking us, we don't want a roof. We want something to be more than just a roof because there is some institutions giving them what they want, but they are not feeling happy in it. And they are, there is a lot of problems in it. So sometimes they're calling the people and they said, it's better for us to stay in the shed, better than staying in something like this. So, you know, like too many things is focusing on us to give like, to be able to give them what they want. And even they are, because it is like, it's going with them a psychological effect. So they're asking for a specific shape sometimes to, to give them a comfortable way. So sometimes they're asking for like giving them like a special design to having a doors, open windows, having a natural light to get inside of that uh, temporary structure. Because some of the examples we notice look like you are living in a cave. And we know what's the meaning of cave like in our area. So uh, like, yeah, <laughs> so like, all of these thinking, thinking like all of these things is restrict us to go far away just by fabricating and go ahead with the, just publishing if we want to say because the main thing for us is the publishing and just focusing on the study or research side and keeping the other application side. Thank you. Thank you for that. That, that looks like you've got a lot of um, different, oh, well, it's flexible. Yeah. There's a lot of different applications that yeah. this could be put yeah. to. Uh, Mohammed, <laughs> not only did you talk about your sustainable aquaculture project, but you also alluded to some other research. What other research are you working on? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I, I do piano and science, so this is my life. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm biochemist by training, and then I got another degree in chemistry. Then I have a master's degree in immunology and another master in nanotechnology 
and then a PhD in structural biology and drug design. And now I'm doing my second PhD in uh, uh, drug discovery. <laughs> I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but this, it's, it's not about collecting degrees. It's, it's a passion that I follow all my life. So before coming to, to Australia, I was just telling here my story, why I have a second PhD. I was coming here to invest with the three biggest water companies, ALS, SEQ, and Gold Coast. They are my partners. So we started this journey to have a machine, a portable machine that can go for water quality assurance and that machine will be like a revolution in the testing facilities. Then Corona came, I stuck at home, Brussels was so bad. And then we had, uh, or I got another epiphany, how I can treat prostate cancer without using the conventional way. And it worked. So even just yesterday, I filed for four patents uh, during my PhD. So the machine was meant to detect any fingerprint it's in water, in cattle, in farms, in humans, in whatsoever. But we need to start with a proof of concept. So we went to CSIRO, and we won the best team. And we received $5,000 just uh, last week. So from there, we learned that we need to have an initial market. And I found that there is a huge pain in aquaculture. So I didn't know that prone is the biggest source of protein here in Australia and globally. So I said, okay, everyone needs protein, childs, grown-ups, and everyone. So let's focus on aquaculture. And our technology, thanks to the scientist, she was there, lamp technology. It's a very well-established technique. So all what we need is just to polish it, add it with the right scientist. I was dazzled by the quality of my uh, partners, my team. I can do it without them. And now we have a TRL7 product, a super sm smarter than any one of us, just because it digests a lot of data. And it's a start for uh, a long journey. Next thing, I'm going to cattle, to livestock. I will go to humans one day, to farmers. So it's, I'm 40. <laughs> That's very impressive. I thought I have a qualification from each of the Brisbane-based universities, so no favouritism, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely being pipped at the post by Mohammed. <laughs> but trust me, my, the team, like if, if, if I have to say there is a, a success in this project or any other project I do, it's my team. I'm just uh, like part, it's, it's like a part of a big machine and they did everything. So thanks to you. <laughs> it's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to get Mohammed's team up here for a bow. <laughs> So, Emma Ann, we're moving on to you, and, and you're um, also in the cancer research area, and that was fascinating to hear. How do you think events like this, uh, or why are they so important, and how can you use this further than just pitching in front of all of us? Absolutely. Um, I think that it comes down to a team approach, yeah. as, you were, as you were saying, Mohammed. Um, you can't act in isolation. And I'm a clinician who's now kind of delving into the science space. But when we act in silos, when scientists only talk to scientists, when doctors only talk to doctors, you're ignoring huge, important, and valuable perspectives that you just completely lose if you're by yourself. So I was really ex excited to come today to, you know, chat to other people, see what their perspective of the science is. You know, potentially they have something crucial that we've just missed and overlooked. Fantastic. <laughs> um, but also to learn about other things. I mean, I had no idea about aquaculture and food sovereignty and stuff before today, so I've had a wonderful time. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. That's part of the importance of this is there's networks you know, across um, divisions, the transdisciplinary nature, not just staying in your silo, as you very um, rightly referred to. Sarah, so breaking the wall of food sovereignty and how to get benefits to, to those whose, whose products we are using, whose plants we are using. Um, what inspired you to undertake this research? Um, I think it would have to be the just interdisciplinary nature of this project. It was not like a traditional PhD. I, I had the privilege to go to like remote areas of Alice Springs and Dow in three months after I moved to Australia. So <laughs> that was a very uh, unique, eye-opening experience for me. And I think that gave me a lot of perspective on why, uh, the why of, 
all of this and you know really set my uh, priorities and what I need to be focusing on because uh, before this I was one of those scientists that only did science and didn't really think about the social aspects of the impact that science has and I think this uh, project I'm six months out from uh, submitting my thesis so just the little over three years has given me such a new perspective on the importance that science plays. Yeah. That's really good. Thank you for sharing. But one extra question, which I was going to ask you um, from the floor before, but how do you ensure that the benefits are shared back to, to the native landholders on where the products are sourced? Okay. So uh, just like the previous presenter, I don't work by myself. I'm part of an ARC centre the, called the ARC Centre for Uniquely Australian Food. And we actually have an Indigenous advisory board and an, and an Indigenous enterprise group. So all of the decisions and the general direction of all of our PhD projects goes through them. So And we receive cultural training on how to talk to communities and interact with them and how to respectfully uh, report the information that they share with us. So, uh, and they are informed on every step that we take and they have the right to say yes or no to anything that we do. So I think that gives them a lot of authority and ownership and it's not just that we are forcing them to come with us, it's more like we are walking along with them. So I think that perspective really changes the way we uh, do the work, yeah. For sure. No, that sounds much, uh, you know, a true partnership model, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Co-designing. Thank you for that extra information. Now, Giovanna, sorry, you're the last again. <laughs> Listening to you, I was very inspired because this is a real problem and, and not, not only in medtech but in biotech but in, in other fields as we know. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask you about your vision, a question I asked earlier, but what would your vision for success be? Well, for this project, the principal idea is develop a program focused uh, in incentive and entrepreneurial intention. The name will be Matilda Power. Why? Because Ma Matilda say, what will happen if Einstein had been born a woman? We probably will not, will not know who Einstein is today. We want to support the women, their vision, their projects, and we want to develop a program that will focus in uh, the gender sensitive business education will be integrated by no general knowledge, by the mindset of empower women, but also the bio markets. The communication and pitch, uh, pitch will be how uh, one of the major problems is how to get investment. It like how they can get investment in major competence, but also with <coughs> investors, uh, with in, uh, angel investors, capitalists. The part of multidisciplinary link is very, very important to, the, to them to work with different areas, uh, but, but it's a little bit tricky. That is why we are going to help them that they can work not only a per woman in STEM and biotech, they can work with administration, with finance, with contability, with this kind of person to get a real synergy because it's very important to get the right uh, and the, uh, the, the the business partners, as we can see, to get a real project. And finally, the mentorship. One of the areas that one of my mentors said me that the success of a woman, and many times, is because of mentorship and the growth of them. And I am the proof, I have many mentors uh, uh, from US Department, from uh, London, and they helped me to embrace that vision and to help me to develop. And my mentor, Dietmar, with Shane, my supervisor, are great and helped me to develop all these projects. We want to help the next generation of women to become the, the woman entrepreneur, to create more uh, big, biggest projects, to help them to launch to their project to the market. And with that, in the future, we have a biggest uh, health, uh, health company, a health industry, to to avoid these kind of things that happen in recent years. Thank you for that. Those thoughts are really good, and it just shows mentors are really critical, and and at all stages of your life, you never you never pass beyond having a mentor or sounding board to help you in your decision making and 
deciding on the next steps or the, the general shape of where things are going. There were some very good conversations and extra information. Uh, this is a very articulate group who were able to respond to any question that I threw at them and who, who gave us a lot more information about their aspirations, their visions for the future, how important events like this are and how they are the next group to inspire our next cohort of young people coming through who will be our next you know, well-known researchers, entrepreneurs in whatever field and breaking the walls and breaking the barriers across a whole range of endeavours. Thank you very much for all of your um, answers to my questions. The judging panel has made a decision and the three finalists have been selected. <coughs> Excellent. So what we'll do now, I will ask, sorry, I know you just sat back down, but I'll ask you all to come and stand back up <laughs> at the front. Um, and I'll also ask um, Julia and Serena to join us here as well. Um, and we will shortly um, announce the finalists and the People's Choice Award winner. And uh, um, we will hand over the certificates. But first, I'd like to invite Julia just to say a few words on the uh, Australia Germany Research Network um, and provide a little more context. Yes. Thank you. We'll be very quick because I know everyone is waiting for the winners to be announced, but I thought I'd take the opportunity because you are the right audience here to just announce, uh, mention to you the Australia Germany Research Network that maybe you have heard of, maybe not. It definitely exists, uh, was established a few years ago to connect. Uh, research from Germany and Australia or people with a connection to either of the countries uh, bring them together through networking events and well there's also a LinkedIn group with over I think 1,800 people by now which is quite a lot and uh, we and Michael and I and Tamara we actually have a, a talk this afternoon to set up an event uh, here in Queensland very soon hopefully uh, in the context of the uh, Brisbane German Week and the Science Day that's part of it as well so maybe just um, um, yeah, um, keep your e ears and eyes open um, to read on the social media channels about it and maybe uh, come if you have time. Um, we definitely hope to get all the experts here in the room and also in the universities and in Queensland together and connect you with also German scientists uh, from all different kinds of fields. So just wanted to, you know, uh, make you aware of that this is also a thing and uh, yeah, stay in touch <laughs> about it as well. But so that should be enough because we're here for something else. And uh, Perfect, thank yeah. you. Um, so if you'd all now like to, to come up and I will hand back to you to work through the um, three finalists and yeah. then Serena will announce the people's choice as well. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for giving me the hardest part of announcing the, the winners here, which is extremely difficult because all the presentations were um, yeah, very insightful, very diverse, which doesn't make it any easier to compare, of course, and it was really great uh, hearing and learning from all of you. Um, maybe just one or two sentences before, because uh, I actually had the pleasure of also taking part in Falling Walls in Berlin uh, last year, because I only moved to Australia in March. So um, it's definitely a huge event. It, you know, the, you saw the video before and everyone explained to you, and it is actually really huge. There are thousands of people, very high level people from science, from politics, looking at the event. And um, I mean, when the wall came down, you know, it changed the lives of so many people, actually, including me, because I'm from, from the east part of Germany and I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for that event um, but I'm only one example and I guess translating this to the world of science now um, you know looking at the next invention and where the future goes and what can maybe change the life of so many people um, with scientific research and new ideas it's really great and so it's really important to bringing scientists from all over the world together so uh, thank you for taking part in this today and um, well I wish I could send you all to Berlin hopefully <laughs> at least you come you know maybe not with falling walls another occasion there or there are so plenty of uh, you know things you can do and join but anyway so uh, let's um, get to the point um, so we have three winners, um, which is really hard because you all were really great, but I'll just make it short. So the first one uh, I would like to, well, you're already on the stage, but maybe ask to step uh, forward uh, is actually uh, Miss Sarah Susan Jacob. Um, <laughs> welcome. Sorry. 
So we got a certificate for you. We really liked, um, you know, how you linked um, the indigenous knowledge uh, to food sovereignty. And we think it's a field there. It's not, you know, there can be still be tapped into and uh, still be looked into that in more deeply. And we think, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, good research in it. And so uh, congratulations. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Good. So, um, second person I would also uh, like to step um, uh, forward is uh, Miss Himan Himanchi uh, Galaya. Sorry for pronouncing the name. Probably <laughs> wrong. I'm very sorry. Um, we really liked your presentation. So incredible. Very, you know, motivated. Really great. And obviously, uh, this idea can change the lives of very many people. So um, congratulations. I'm going to uh, Canberra first. Um, <laughs> of course, that's the next step before someone can go to Berlin. So I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, uh, maybe seeing you in Canberra as well, because uh, that's why I'm based. And I hope um, yeah, to see you there uh, in a couple of weeks. Well, um, so there's uh, one more person. Uh, we would like to give a certificate and send to Canberra. And um, so just waiting a second, making it even more exciting. <laughs> Do we have it? <laughs> Do we have the uh, paper? Oh, okay, great. Um, so this is actually um, Dr. Emma and Carlson. Uh, congratulations. Um, <laughs> So yeah, very impressive research on uh, cancer research, something we is very important and that we all want to uh, fight, obviously. So uh, congratulations and yeah, well, welcome to Canberra first and then hopefully uh, welcome to Berlin to some of you or well, <laughs> congratulations. Yeah. Okay, um, so I just wanted to mention that um, Emma is uh, the first place in the contestant. So as you see, it's uh, like a little, you know, bronze, silver, and uh, and and uh, gold uh, here. But you're all winners, and actually, also congratulations to all of you taking part in this and hopefully making some really good connections. And yes, you know, we heard some really good ideas, and I just wanted to mention definitely I and I think everyone else will also take this idea forward. Maybe even if it's not with the falling walls now, you know, with other there are lots of other uh, opportunities for cooperation. And I think I learned a lot. And when speaking to other people, definitely keep your ideas in mind as well. So congratulations um, as well to you for taking part. Thank you. I have the very great pleasure of presenting the um, choice of the floor today of all the people in the room. But before I do so, again, I just wanted to also convey my sincerest congratulations to all of the um presenters here today, your work was awe-inspiring. What you're doing with your research is absolutely incredible and we need people like you to break down the walls and you are in fact all doing that regardless of whether you've placed today or whether you're um, just participating and I really hope this experience, um, as others have said, has opened some doors for you, has uh, will open some connections for you and will um, take your research to the next level. So thank you very, very much for putting yourselves out today. It's not lost on us how um, big it is for you to, to come and present to us and we really do extremely appreciate you doing so. So um, with great pleasure, I announce the People's Choice Award winner as Dr Natalie Cervantes-Guzman. So congratulations, Natalie. <laughs> Wonderful. And we have um, some certificates of participation as well. So I'll, I'll ask you, Lauren, to hand those out um, and perhaps ask everyone to, to come back on the stage so that we can do a, a final vote of thanks, round of applause. <coughs>
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lauren. And uh, a big round of applause for all our finalists and presenters today. <laughs> Excellent. So this actually concludes the formal part of the event. Um, Congratulations, you've done really well. You can relax now and enjoy the rest of the day. Um, and we wish you every success um, as you continue with your research activities. And we can't wait to hear how you will progress and, and where you take your visions in the future. Um, and please also make sure you spread the word about this event. And we're so glad to hear that you enjoyed it. Um, I would like to once again thank all of our special guests, partners, judging panel, um, Study Queensland, our network partners and everybody who's joined the event here in Brisbane today and made it such a success. Um, a special thanks to, to UQ Global Partnerships. Huge amount of effort goes into putting on an event like this um, and in particular Tamara Weisflog and Jessica Court as well as the rest of the Global Partnerships team, the staff, the volunteers, the suppliers, everybody who made today possible. Um, thank you so much. So a big round of applause. We've now got some uh, refreshments at the back of the room, so please do stay around, meet with the presenters, network, talk with people, because you never know who you might meet that could help you on your own falling walls journey. So with that, um, I'd like to close the event and thank you all, and please enjoy the hospitality. Thanks. Thanks.